And with that, let me introduce today's presenter. Uh, today's presenter is Lisa Potter. And Lisa is the Private Land Program Supervisor and Farm Bill Coordinator for the Missouri Department of Conservation. She's received a Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife uh, Biology from Kansas State University and a uh, Master's of Science in Ecology and um, Evolutionary Biology from Iowa State University. And with that, Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bob. Um, and thank you to those who have called in. I'm excited to uh, be here and talk about this, uh, this topic here. Um, I'll just jump right in. Um, the we have several discussion items to go over in the webinar this morning um, or this afternoon for those folks that are on the Eastern uh, time zone. So the first thing I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about the grassland bird declines. Um, we'll review just the basics of the CP33 uh, habitat buffer program policy. And then I'll go through a few slides of, of showing how those CP33 policy uh, requirements tie to Bob White Quail habitat. Um, we'll hit on just a little bit of some establishment hints um, for um, successfully getting a stand um, established. And then we'll go over the importance of mid-contract management. And then lastly, we'll briefly touch on the importance of, of, of addressing grassland on the ag landscape uh, using a landscape scale approach. OK. so. Um, Grassland birds uh, are actually the most rapidly declining group of birds in the United States. And this population loss, or the population declines, are largely attributed to habitat loss. Um, this is the conversion of prairie habitats, native grasslands, pastures, and hay fields, that conversion to row crops. And of course, it's not just conversion to row crops or agriculture, but it's also urbanization. Um, and on top of the habitat loss, when we're talking about the ag landscape, we're also talking about just how the intensity of the ag um, um, agricultural practices have, have increased over time. So for instance, a lot of times nowadays there's um, earlier, more frequent mowing and haying. Um, a lot of time the pastures are overgrazed. Um, and there's always the issue of non-native introduced grass species that um, are often very aggressive um, and very easily sometimes invade and really degrade the habitat quality of our natural communities, our native grasslands. Um, and also it's, it's the lack of of uh, management, lack of disturbance. So we're talking about early successional species here. So obviously, to keep that early successional habitat, you need disturbance. So um, today, there's a lot less fire on the landscape, and just the, the general disturbance practices, such as disking or spraying. Um, and so all of these have come together to um, contribute to habitat loss, but also to contribute to the degrading of the habitat quality out there. Um, results from the North American Breeding Bird Survey actually suggest that 43% of grassland species and 36% of successional scrub species exhibited significant population decline since the 1966 um, year when the Breeding Bird Survey first began. So if we go specifically and look at quail, um, you can see from the graph there that uh, quail have been exhibiting significant population declines um, for many years. And this is happening throughout the range um, uh, of the northern bobwhite. Um, and actually, if you look at that graph, and if you, according to the Breeding Bird Survey, northern bobwhites have declined, on average, 3% per year since 1966. So that is obviously a um, significant decrease and one that is not not um, uh, really able to be continued if we want to see uh, quail continue on the landscape. Um, <clears throat> And again, just as I spoke earlier, habitat um, quality, habitat loss is a main factor to these population declines. And it's not just quail, so it's other grassland bird species. So this is a, a kind of a busy slide here, but the point that I want to make with all these graphs is that here is six species, six examples of birds, of grassland birds, that at least in the Midwest region, region are typically considered common. And you can see from um, the common theme of the downward sliding uh, population graph are these common birds are also uh, uh, experiencing significant population declines for, for many years. So just starting there at the top 
left-hand corner of the slide, we've got the eastern meadowlark, uh, the field sparrow, uh, the dick thistle, the loggerhead shrike, bobolink, uh, the grasshopper sparrow. So all these birds that we typically consider as common on the landscape are also experiencing these, these significant population declines. OK, so before I get into the, the specifics of the CP33 uh, habitat practice, I wanted to provide a little bit of history of just how the CP33 practice got started. Uh, so in response to these population declines um, with the, the quail decreases and range-wide and the grassland birds, um, it was actually back in 1996 when the National Bob White Tech Committee, along with several other wildlife partners, uh, submitted a proposal to the Farm Services Agency, or FSA, to create a new continuous CRP program, um, uh, specifically one that was a buffer program. And it was in 2004 that FSA actually started the CP33 habitat uh, buffers for upland birds. And it was actually done through a pilot. Um, so again, started in 2004. Uh, the pilot program, it was across 35 states. FSA allocated 250,000 acres. Um, and it had a very successful uh, uh, pilot season. Um, so that gives you a little bit of history of where this started um, and the reason why it started. So to get back to the basics, um, again, the CP33 practice is administered by a Farm Services Agency, and it is a continuous conservation reserve program. Uh, so what this means is that typically producers can go into an FSA office at any time, any time of the year, and enroll or, or offer an application to enroll their land into the CP33. Um, and the enrollment is not competitive. And this is in comparison to, say, general CRP, where typically um, the competition is high, uh, the applications or the offers are ranked. Um, so continuous CRP does not have that. So it really offers an opportunity to um, producers, just that, uh, everyday producers that are wanting to do good things uh, for conservation. Now it is a CRP program, so it still follows the, the regular CRP rules. So one of those two rules is um, if to be even eligible to apply for CP33 or offer an application, the, the, the portion of the crop field has to have cropping history. Um, and so what this means is that four out of the six years um, between 2008 and 2013, that crop field had to have been planted in some kind of ag commodity. Um, and these years typically change when there's a new farm bill. Um, but for right now, present day, uh, to be even eligible for this program, that crop ground has to be cropped at least four out of the six years from 2008 and 2013. Um, and it is a 10-year contract, so it is a significant uh, uh, time period or time commitment from from the producers. Um, and I should note, um, just right after I've said this is a continuous CRP program and, and producers can walk in the office at any time, I will note that um, right now we are at the end of our current 2014 farm bill. It is getting ready to expire. Um, and also an issue with um, uh, our CRP acres is that within that farm bill, they put a national acreage cap of how many acres of CRP could be enrolled throughout the country. And that, that, that acreage cap was 25 million acres. And right now, we are right there, right by that 25 million acres. So to better balance that and to make sure FSA does not go over this national cap, they have uh, put a hold on uh, several of the continuous CRP practice enrollments. And CP33 is one of those on hold. Um, they do have some uh, enrollment periods open for some other practices. But right now, it is not possible to enroll in CP33 at this moment. So we are hoping that um, uh, the farm bill is reauthorized on time, and um, we, uh, which is due this fall, um, and that we will get a bump in that national acreage cap so that there will, there will be room for uh, those producers that are interested in rolling in general and continuous CRP will have acres to, to be able to do that. So hopefully, um, we'll be able to start enrollments in CP33 uh, again soon. Oops, sorry about that. 
Okay, more of the basics. Um, so with uh, continuous CRP, um, the producer receives annual payments, and those annual payments are based on soil rental rates. Um, so essentially what happens is the producer walks into the office, um, the office looks at the three most predominant soils on those eligible um, eligible offered acres, um, and they provide um, your average soil rental rates. And those are essentially based on the productivity of the soil. So soils that are more productive will likely have a higher annual payment. Um, and also, it's important to note that these rental rates are based on non-irrigated cropland. So this question comes up a lot, especially in the parts of the, the country or parts of your state that are highly irrigated. Um, so the cash annual rental rates um, are based on non-irrigated cropland value. Um, in addition to the annual payments for CP33, there is also um, a $125 per acre sign-up incentive payment, or a SIP. And this is a, just a one-time payment at the beginning uh, of the contract that is provided to the landowner, which of course helps to encourage, incentivize uh, enrollment into this program. In addition to the SIP payment, there's also a practice, in, practice incentive payment, or a PIP. And what this uh, one-time payment is, is it covers approximately 40% of the total cost of practice installation. Um, so, so this, of course, incentivizes and assists producers um, to cover the cost of putting the CP33 buffer on the ground. Um, and like all the other CRP practices, um, in addition to the annual payments, the SIPs and the PIPs, uh, FSA will typically provide up to 50% cost share for practice installation. So you can see uh, when a producer is looking at these uh, economic aspects of enrollment into the CP33, um, that it can be, uh, in, in a lot of situations, economically beneficial to their operation to look at CP33 for options. And again, I'll, I'll bring up the Farm Bill again, and I think it's the last time I do that, um, but uh, right now, these, these options are available for CP33. Right now, there's a SIP and a PIP and cost share um, and, and, of course, annual payments. Um, however, these items or these components of the continuous CRP practice or program, excuse me, um, are being talked about and discussed with the, the, the Farm Bill reauthorization discussions right now. So we're hoping to see these SIPs and PIPs and, and cost share rates uh, uh, continue on into the next Farm Bill, um, but that will, um, we'll see what happens um, when they reauthorize it, hopefully this fall. But currently these options are available with CP33. Okay, now getting into more of the policy, I wanted to go through some of the actual policy language just to demonstrate how well this program um, is matched with quail habitat, is matched with grass and bird habitat, and just showing that, it, that this practice is essentially designed for early successional uh, quail and grass and birds. Um, so right there from the 2CRP manual, the purpose of the practice is to provide food and cover for quail and upland birds in cropland areas. Uh, the CP33, it's a buffer program, so of course it's installed along field edges or pivot corners. There is a minimum buffer width of 30 feet um, and a maximum average width of 120 feet. So that average width, um, really what that means is, or, or provides the opportunity that for with the, if a producer enrolls in these buffers, they can use these buffers not only to put wildlife habitat on the ground, but also to straighten crop field edges. Um, so for instance, if one part of the field, if they're trying to straighten out that edge, uh, one part of the field might have an average width of, say, 125. Um, and you go further down to keep that straight, that average width might be, say, 115. So it's the maximum average width is 120 feet. Um, and of course, when we're talking about edge species, when we're talking about quail, um, the wider the buffer, the better. Obviously, this is a, um, uh, a component of how much <laughs> cropland a producer is able to set aside into this buffer. But for nesting species, research has shown that the narrower that, that buffer is, uh, basically that increase, increases the probability of a predator fi finding that um, ground nesting bird and predating the nest. So uh, the wider the buffer, the more of a search area that predator has to go through to find that nest. So when all possible, um, uh, try to implement CP33 um, 
as wide as you can or as, long, as wide as is suitable for that producer. Um, I will also mention that pivot corners of any size may be enrolled as CP33. And this is with or without connecting buffers. And this is actually um, a, a new development, a relatively new development. Um, so it used to be the CP33 policy, um, you could only enroll pivot corners uh, basically if it was adjoining a, a, an adjacent buffer strip along the field margin. Um, and so in 2015, um, this issue really started coming to light because we were getting all sorts of uh, uh, responses from producers who were interested in enrolling in CP33. However, on the irrigated landscape, it just was not economically feasible or beneficial to their operation to take out uh, the field margins. Uh, of a field when that ground was actually being irrigated. Um, and so uh, MBCI or MBTC, National Bob White Tech Committee, really led the national um, effort to uh, propose to FSA that they amend the current CP33 policy to allow standalone pivot corners. And that actually came through on, in 2015. Um, and so now you are able to uh, enroll field borders, you're in a, able to enroll pivot corners, essentially whatever fits best with your operation. And, and the two pictures I have here, so on the left, this is an aerial view of um, Texas. And you can see that you know, it might sound um, like a small area that you're dealing with if you're just planning a pivot corner. But if you look at this aerial coverage, and if, if you're looking at it at a landscape scale approach, you can see that when these pivot corners actually start being adjacent to each other, that we're creating significant patches of grassland. And actually, they're often very very much wider than 30 feet, um, again, increasing that, that area, uh, protecting those ground nesting birds. Um, the picture on the right is actually a CP33 buffer in southeast Missouri. Um, and just that's why I thought that was a good visual of just the kind of habitat that is possible in, in creating in the pivot corners of irrigated fields. Oops. <coughs> OK, so back again to policy. So again, I wanted to show that the CP33 practice um, is, is tailored to quail habitat. So you'll see, again, straight from the policy manual, uh, upland buffers will be allowed to revegetate re by natural or basic succession and or be established to adapted species of native warm season grass lagoons, wildflowers, and forbs, um, including shrub and tree plantings. Um, so you'll see this native grasses uh, as a theme with CP33 as well as throughout uh, this presentation. And of course, natives, they're better adapted to withstand the local weather and climate conditions. They're better matched for local pollinators and insects. They're often very drought tolerant. Uh, insect abundance and diversity is commonly much greater in the native season, or the yeah, the native grasses and, and forbs, as compared to introduced species. Um, and as we'll talk later, uh, the more insects that we're able to uh, attract to these areas provides uh, more forage for not only quail but other grassland grassland bird species. So um, that native species, those native grasses, those native forbs are really important to to this practice, CP33 practice. And I'll also point out that. Also in the policy, it says seeding, if it occurs at all, should occur at much lighter rates. Um, again, we're talking about early successional species. So we, we are not looking for a, a thick stand of grass. And so specifically in the CP33 policy, um, we're setting up the conditions where we're able to, per, to create early successional habitat that's diverse and that is at a rate that will provide um, basically uh, open areas along the ground where quail and quail chicks and other grass and birds are able to navigate. OK, so no hanging or grazing is allowed of the buffers. Um, incidental, incidental grazing um, is allowed. So in other words, if a, a producer wants to put his cows out um, on a harvested crop field and they accidentally uh, go onto the buffer, that, that is allowable. Um, and although the policy states uh, that trees and shrubs uh, are required, they do have a policy line that says they should not, shall not exceed 10% coverage. So we certainly don't want this uh, buffer strip to become just a wooded strip. 
And of course, as in all CRP practices, the producer must uh, control noxious weeds uh, throughout the life of the contract. OK, mid-contract management. This is another very essential part um, to the CP33 habitat buffers uh, program. And again, this ties back to trying to maintain that early successional habitat. Uh, early successional habitat needs disturbance. So one of the requirements of this program is that on a rotational basis, um, it's required of that producer to go out there and provide disturbance to that buffer, whether that is light disking or prescribed burning or uh, selective herbicide application, uh, whatever mid-contract management practices are available in their state, they're required to treat each acre um, at least once um, uh, on that buffer. And uh, the mid-contract management practices, they vary by state. Um, and really, that is allowable so that states are able to tailor the specifics of the CP33 practice, whether that's seed mixes or the appropriate management technique um, to that to that state, so they can tailor to the, the appropriate conditions that, that they're dealing with every day. Uh, but I do have in bold um, a reminder, and this is the first time I say that, and I say it a couple more times throughout this, is that always check with your local FSA office first. Um, all the policy notes that I've been talking about, that's been national CP33 policy. Um, and each state typically has state addendums where they can tailor it to their state. So before you um, uh, basically try to apply anything, any kind of management to these buffers, talk to your FSA office. Because the last thing a biologist or a consulting um, biologist want to do is to accidentally get their producer in trouble with FSA um, by uh, providing guidance that, that doesn't follow the terms of their agreement. So um, always check with your local FSA office before, before you actually implement anything on that buffer. OK, the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of the basics of CP33 is location. Um, obviously, this is a buffer program, um, so it's on the, the field margins. And often, it is targeted on those field margins that aren't producing much. Um, so this is also a, a often a good talking point or discussion point if you're uh, discussing CP33 with a producer. So this picture on the right um, shows you that, especially in, in crop field margins that are adjacent to say, a tree line, those first few rows of, of crop, corn in this case, um, really are not producing <laughs> much. And however, that producer is often still putting all the input costs there. So they're still putting the, the seed and the fertilizer and the herbicides and the pesticides and um, just all the costs that go into producing a crop are still going on those acres, but they are not receiving that um, uh, economically in the yield that they're getting. So a good discussion is ha to have with producers to see if this is appropriate is, is show them or discuss with them that with the CP33 buffer, uh, they could essentially install that buffer in those areas where they are not producing the yield. Um, they'll get the, the annual rental payments and the, the SIPs and the PIPs and the cost share, and then they can go back and pencil it out to see if it is uh, appropriate for their operation. Um, and, and just there to, to re-emphasize the point, so the, the ears of corn there, um, these were produced by the same farmer, the same field, um, same inputs. The, the larger um, ear of corn there on the left, that was produced right adjacent to a CP33 buffer. Um, and the smaller ear of corn was produced um, essentially based in one of these lower uh, uh, yield producing rows um, adjacent to a fence line, a timbered fence line. Uh, so you can see that um, in a lot of situations, there can be a potential huge difference um, in yield just by placement of the CP33 buffer. <coughs> OK, so how does this uh, CP33 work for the birds? So obviously, this is a very important question. Um, and actually, back in 20, 2004, when this first started, when it was first a pilot program, uh, FSA actually charged the uh, Southeast Quail Study Group, it was, which is now the National Bob White Tech Committee, um, with the development of a coordinated CP33 monitoring program. Um, and so MBTC took this as a great opportunity um, to uh, basically coordinate and develop uh, 
a monitoring effort throughout the entire range of the northern bobwhite. Um, and this, uh, this monitoring effort included not just quail, but other grass and bird species. So in 2006 through 2011, uh, uh, there was a coordinated monitoring effort across 14 states. It contained 80% of the enrolled CP38 CP33 acreage uh, at that time. Breeding season surveys were taken. Fall point count transect monitoring was completed. So it really was a, a, a great comprehensive look at the potential programmatic impacts of CP33 on bobwhite populations and grassland bird populations. So just to show you uh, a little bit of the results from, from that monitoring effort, um, here is the breeding season results for northern bobwhite. And the green buffers there are uh, monitoring points from CP33 buffers. And the red color there is uh, the control sampling done on a field that is not buffered with CP33. And you can see there consistently uh, bobwhite populations or bobwhite densities were better or higher on uh, fields that were buffered with CP33. Um, in fact, we observed breeding season bobwhite densities that were 85 to 109 percent greater on CP33 buffered fields than non-buffered fields. Here is a graph showing uh, the results of the monitoring for the, the fall surveys. And again, you can see um, just by glancing at, at this, this graph is the, even the fall bobwhite uh, populations were significantly better on the buffered fields than the non-buffered. Um, we observed 50 to 110 percent greater fall bobwhite cubby densities on CP33 buffered fields as compared to the non-buffered. Um, cubby densities were over three times greater on CP33 buffered fields um, in the, just the southeastern coastal plain alone. So we can see from here, so far CP33 is doing very good for bobwhite populations. How about some of these other birds that we discussed earlier? What about the other grass and birds that we looked at? So here's looking at uh, dick thistle. Uh, we observed 85 to 119 percent greater dick thistle densities on CP33 buffered fields as compared to non-buffered. Field sparrow, 58 to 106 percent greater field sparrow densities on, on CP33 fields. Now, how about eastern meadowlark? Now, eastern meadowlark, they exhibited essentially no response to the buffers. Um, they, and even in some instances, they had greater densities on the non-buffered fields, um, at least in four out of the six years. And lastly, let's look at the grasshopper sparrow. That's another species that is experiencing significant declines. Um, and again, the, what our monitoring was showing is that these populations or these densities were varying widely, um, but really only exhibited a substantial positive response in a couple of years, and that was in 2009 and 2010. So does CP33 work for the birds? For quail, absolutely. For several species of, of other grassland birds, absolutely. It wasn't a home run for every species that was monitored. But even if CP33 is, is, is able to address those birds that primarily uh, uh, maintain or, or or essentially maintain their activities in early successional habitat, CP33, I think, was proven without a doubt to be positive for quail and grassland birds. So why is CP33, why does this program work so well for quail? Well, in short, it, the policy was designed to put quail habitat on the ground. Uh, quail are an early successional species. They focus their activities on the edge. So obviously, a buffer program uh, is going to provide that habitat and that transition zone or transition zone or that edge between two larger habitats. Um, they're an early successional species. So those policies uh, that I showed you that are requiring the light diverse seeding mixes, um, that those light seeding mixes and those diverse native mixes are going to help maintain that early successional habitat, that structure, for longer. Uh, the required mid-contract management, that of course is going to put that, that required disturbance back on the landscape. Uh, so really, in so many ways, the CP33 pol uh, uh, program policy uh, really mirror mirrors the primary habitat requirements of quail. So in the next few slides, I'm going to uh, really demonstrate kind of what we're looking for with the pre 
three primary habitat requirements for quail, which is nesting habitat, brooding habitat, escape, and loafing habitat, and then how CP33 can provide that. So nesting habitat. So what are we looking for when we're talking about quail nesting? So we're looking for moderately dense stands of grasses. And even though I have moderately up there, I would almost change that to um, very low dense stand of grasses, legumes and annual weeds. And a very important component here is the open nature at ground, ground level. Um, and we're, we're focused where we really want the native season bunch grasses. And that structure of that grass, the, the native warm seasons or cool seasons that grow in that brunch, brunch or excuse me, bunch uh, structure, um, that is helping maintain that open nature at ground level. And that's going to enable the quail, whether it's an adult quail or a chick, to easily navigate um, through that while they still, still have the nice overhead canopy of the taller grasses. And again, back to the edge species, reach, research has shown that quail often build their nests within 50 to 70 feet of an edge or an opening with bare ground. So again, this ties back to um, implementing a buffer practice. Um, and I also wanted to point out that um, in, in just the discussion of how much grass you need for nesting habitat, that's always a discussion point. There was some research in uh, South Texas that actually showed that nest productivity peaked at about one clump of grass per 100 square foot. So if you imagine a 10 foot by 10 foot square, you really only need one clump of grass to, to provide that structure. All that other space should be should be filled in with native forbs, annual weeds, annual grasses, um, but you want that, that open nature at ground level. Okay, and again, just tying back to policy, native warm season grasses are required at much lighter rates. Okay, so I've been talking a, a while, so I thought we would um, do a polling question for the group. So I asked the group, would this native grassland field in this picture um, be considered as quality nesting habitat for bobwhite quail? OK, well, it looks like most folks, um, well, there's still some answering. Give you a couple more minutes. There we go. So the answer is no. <laughs> so even though that this is a picture of native grass, it's a picture of Indian grass and little blue stem, um, you can see that that poor little child is, is about lost uh, in that stand of native grasses. So whether we're talking about native grasses or introduced grasses, if there is a field border or an area planted at that level of thickness, quail are just simply not going to use it. They just can't navigate it. Um, so this would not be a good example of quality nesting habitat. OK, well, let's talk about the second um, essential habitat component for, for quail habitat, brood rearing. So what we're talking with brood rearing is an area that is primarily native forbs, legumes, annual weeds, um, and that essential bare ground cover. We're talking 30 to 70 percent bare ground. Um, and the reason why we need that bare ground is if you look at that picture and that size of that chick, um, uh, that chick it needs that bare ground if it has any shot of foraging and um, surviving um, the first few weeks of life. So uh, bobwhite chicks are precocial, uh, which means that within hours of hatching, they are up and running looking for bugs. And so having an area that is primarily consistent consisting of native forbs and legumes, um, th those, those flowering plants are going to bring in those e insects. Um, they're going to provide that high level of protein that chicks need for the first few weeks of, of development. And you can see there on my point, for the first few weeks of life, 80 to 95 percent of a chick's diet consists of insects. So it's essential that we're providing habitat or a space where they, they have a, a chance of being successful um, in foraging. And so just to put things in perspective, this is the size of a, of a quail chick when it leaves the, 
leaves a, its nest. So we're talking about the size of your thumb. Um, and they're very vulnerable um, uh, at this time period. Actually, really less than half of bobwhite chicks survive into, until winter. So not only are they super tiny, um, needing that bare ground component, but they also uh, can't thermoregulate their temperature very well at this stage of life. So if you imagine um, a thick grass field, that whether it's rain or whether it's dew in the morning, if that chick is trying to make it through uh, that thick grass and gets uh, drenched by, by the water, um, that's really going to potentially uh, hamper their ability to survive just because they can't thermoregulate their temperature. So I know we've all seen fields like this. This is a, a very overgrown, unmanaged um, fescue field. Um, this could be whatever sod um, uh, type grass, uh, introduced grass that you have in your state. But obviously, if you're looking at a field like this, whether it's a whole field or a buffer, um, uh, this is unusable space for quail and, and quail chicks especially. There's no way that they're making, them, making it through uh, that field. So this is really what we're looking for. Um, if you notice, there's lots of bare ground. However, you still have lots of uh, forbs and legumes. I think most of that is ragweed, maybe some annual grasses in there. So you're getting that bare ground. You're bringing in those insects. You're bringing in the seed. And you still have a nice overhead cover to protect from, from predators. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking uh, brood habitat. OK, and again, tying back to policy, but then the policy, it's requiring to have a diverse uh, uh, of not just grasses, but also legumes, wildflowers, and forbs. And again, at that much lighter rate. So we're hopefully maintaining that open nature, that bare ground, as long as we can um, on this buffer practice. And just for an example, um, I, I've included what the Missouri seeding is right now for CP33. Um, and you can see we've got two species of native grass at a relatively low rate. But then we also require three pounds of forbs. Um, and we also recommend that we're talking at least nine species of these forbs. Um, because we really want to make sure that we're getting the diversity in, we're bringing in those pollinators, we're bringing in those insects. Um, so again, uh, make sure to check with your FSA office on what your specific seeding mix requirements are for your state. OK, just briefly, I thought while we're talking seeding mixes that I'd put up a few hints that, at least here in Missouri, we have uh, discovered really helps in terms of establishment. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there uh, that establishing native warm seasons um, can be difficult or is hard. Um, and really, it comes down to um, a couple of things, at, at least um, what we're finding here in Missouri. Uh, site prep is huge. Um, really, probably one of the most important things um, that you can address before you plant your seed. Um, with CP33, obviously, we're talking about um, planting into uh, a crop field. So hopefully, you're not dealing with too much um, vegetation, but, but you will on those edges closer to the, to the fence line or so, you'll, you'll get into um, basically uh, often uh, in introduced aggressive species. So you need to get rid of that existing vegetation um, that is going to potentially hinder that seed to soil contact or provide excessive competition. Um, so this is key to uh, successful establishment of warm seasons. Um, and that could, that could include um, one management technique, say chemical application, or it could be so thick you, you need to, to combine a couple. So maybe you hay the area or mow the area first, followed up by chemical application. But uh, without a proper site prep seed bed, um, you, it is likely to have some difficulty of getting, getting the CP33 established. Um, and again, you need the appropriate seed mix. Um, always, as much as possible, aim for that uh, high, high diversity mix with both native grasses and forbs. Um, in Missouri, another thing I wanted to point out is the timing. We have found that um, in Missouri, uh, native uh, grass and forb plantings do much better when we plant them during the dormant season, so late fall over the winter. Uh, and what this does, um, especially for the forbs, um, is because so many forb species need that 30 to 90 to even sometimes longer cold, moist stratification period, that overwintering period that it's, it's, it's already on the ground is providing that stratification period. Um, and it also avoids giving the grasses too much of a head start. So, so what I'm talking about here is, 
if, if you're planting both the, the grasses and the forbs at the same time in the spring, um, in most cases, those grasses are going to start developing first. So before the forbs really have a chance to develop, all that available space or a lot of the available space and nutrients are already be being taken up by the grasses. So the dormant season um, just helps to, to better balance that mix is what we're finding, uh, at least in Missouri. Okay, the third essential component to quail habitat is escape and loafing habitat. And we really refer to these as cubby headquarters. And um, what we're talking about here is, is essentially a group of woody shrubs or low growing trees. We're talking about trees and shrubs that are less than 12 foot. Um, and they need this year round. Uh, they use this for loafing and dusting in the summer. They, they use it for protection from um, uh, inclement weather, whether that's hot summer or, or harsh winters. And of course, protection from, from predators. Uh, and again, I'll point out that if you want that cubby headquarters to be useful to quail, you need to make sure that that ground cover um, is sparse underneath that, head, that uh, cubby headquarters. Um, and I also will point out that we've got some research here in Missouri that found quail in winter spend most of their time within 70 feet of woody cover. So this is uh, an indication for planning the locations of your shrubby cover when you're planning your buffer uh, because the location of the shrubby cover or the cubby headquarters essentially will determine where those quail are hanging out. If they're not going to go farther than 70 feet from woody cover in winter, um, then that really limits how far they can travel um, within and around that buffer. So that's something to think about when you're planning um, the CP33 buffers. So to provide a couple examples, so uh, this might be your typical fence line or tree line that you see in the ag setting. Um, obviously, there is no shrubs. Uh, there's essentially no cover there. Um, and it's worthless or close to it <laughs> um, to quail uh, and, and most grass and birds. So if you plant, can't plant native shrubs in association with your 33 buffer, um, what it is potentially an option is to complete some edge feathering or down tree structure. And what this, this practice is, is um, uh, pretty self-explanatory, is you're going into that existing timber line or fence line and, and maybe taking out some of those trees that are over that 12 foot. 12 foot uh, height difference. And essentially what you're doing is you're going to windrow the tops of those trees, uh, creating instant cubby headquarters. So hopefully while those native shrubs are developing, through the edge feathering practice, you have instantaneously created uh, protective cover, loafing cover um, that is essential for quail. So to give you another visual, this is what we're talking um, about here. So again, we want to make sure to have that open ground. So before you cut the trees to edge feather, before you cut those trees to make a down tree structure, or where you're going to place that down tree structure, make sure you kill out those, those, uh, the, the ground cover there, especially if it's some kind of sod, sod forming grass like fescue or brome or, or Bermuda grass or, or whatever you're dealing with in your state. And I also wanted to point out kind of the, you know, all the branches. We're, we're focused on the tops of the trees. So the analogy I like to use is if you had a basketball and you threw that basketball on top of that, that cubby headquarters that you've just created or that edge feathering that you've just created, you want that basketball to fall down um, through that, um, the, the, cubby headquarter and you want it bouncing off several of the branches before it actually finally drops to the bottom. Um, whereas um, if you threw a basketball up on top and it just immediately fell right to the ground, then you have not created enough protective cover, overhead cover um, from predators. So here's just another example showing you what edge feathering can look like. And again, best case scenario, so um, if you're not able to plant native shrubs and you need to use the edge feathering or down tree structures, the hope is whether that producer is throwing in uh, seeds for native shrubs into that edge feathering or whether a bird just does it naturally doing its thing, um, the hope is that you'll have native shrubs or vines coming up that through that edge feathering, through those down tree structures that will even provide a better um, overhead canopy, um, will keep that area free of thick grass underneath um, and also provide some food um, as well within that, that protective structure. Okay, and again, tying back to policy, uh, limited shrub and tree plantings um, are within the policy. 
Um, and again, I put an example of what's required in Missouri. So in Missouri, we require a tenth of an acre per 40 acres of shrubby cover. Um, and this can be completed through uh, na native shrub plantings, edge feathering, or down tree structures. And we also have a size requirement. We don't want just one tree out there um, being fell felled and then call that a cubby headquarters. So to qualify, it needs to be at least 30 foot by 50 foot um, uh, to qualify as one cubby headquarter. Um, and again, I'll reemphasize, spray before you cut. Um, otherwise, uh, quail just won't use it. Um, and again, this is the Missouri example. This is what's in the Missouri policy. Check with your local FSA office um, to see what the specific requirements are for your state um, when it comes to shrubby cover. So again, this is just showing an example. Even though you've got some shrubs here, the, the ground cover is thick fescue, so it essentially makes it not usable for quail um, or very, very low, low quality cubby headquarter. And also, I see quite a few of these um, on the landscape um, that, that folks are trying to call cubby headquarters. And in my mind, this is a brush pile. And anything that looks like um, a bulldozer pushed it together um, is not going to be good for quail. And if you think back to that basketball analogy, if you threw a basketball on top of that, it's not going to make its way down to the ground. It's, this, this is just too thick. So, um, yeah, this is not an example of what we're looking for in terms of cubby headquarters. Okay, and then finally I wanted to um, just talk a little bit um, about the placement. Um, I talked a little bit uh, before about the research from Missouri um, about wintertime, about quail not uh, moving much farther away than 70 foot from cubby headquarters or escape cover. Research from Texas is also showing that the average flight distance for quail is only about 141 feet. Uh, so if you think about um, providing quality habitat uh, for quail, you need to think about the placement of your cubby headquarters or, or your shrubby cover. So in other words, if a quail is flushed from a predator or a person or whatever, um, it's only going to fly about 141 feet. And if there's not a cubby headquarter there, then they might be lacking in finding additional protective cover. So uh, that's something also to consider uh, in your planning um, for the CP33 buffers. Okay, so another polling question. Um, wake everybody up. Does your state require shrubby cover to be included with CP33 enrollment? Okay. Looks like the most, most folks um, um, don't know. So if you do have a question about that, um, visit your FSA office. <laughs> You're going to get tired of me saying that uh, before the end of this. But thank you for responding to that question. So the next thing I wanted to touch on was mid-contract management. And again, this is a um, essential part of maintaining the quality of a CP33 buffer and, a, and quail habitat in general. Um, and I want to point out, we've already seen this text, but I want to point out the first line where it says the buffer shall be disturbed on a rotational basis. So essentially what this means is that um, we are not wanting producers, um, if at all possible, to apply their mid-contract management on 100% of the acres in one year. Um, if, if it's if it's allowable in policy, if the producer is able to do it, uh, we recommend applying that mid-contract management, say, in thirds or half the field. So say uh, year one, um, you only do um, white disking on a third of the buffer acres. And that next year, you'll do the next third. And the third year, you'll do the final third of that, the acres in that buffer. So that way, by spacing it out by making it rotational, you're making sure there's always habitat available. You're not just clearing out all cover, all habitat in one year. Uh, so the rotational schedule, if you will, does vary by state. So this is another uh, check with your local office. Um, but if possible, we do recommend going at least a third or a half in terms of, of when you can apply that, that mid-contract management. And in most, most uh, states or um, that I'm aware of, typically that mid-contract management is planned in years three through six of that 10-year contract. So trying to split that 10 years up so that um, you're making sure that that grass is not getting too thick um, by the middle of the contract. 
Okay, again, um, options for mid-contract management practices vary by state. Um, in some states, you can only apply one practice. In other states, you can combine. So for instance, um, if you wanted to follow up prescribed burning with strip disking, that may be an option um, in your state. It's just very variable uh, between states and across the Bob White range. But the take home point is that with, with mid-contract management, you can potentially take uh, an older buffer, like what's showing in this picture, where the grass has started to dominate. It's, it's getting too thick. Um, the, the, there's, very, there's very few forbs that I see, lack of diversity. So the hope is that you apply mid-contract management, and you'll hit back those, those grasses, decrease the, the thickness or density of that stand, and allow other forbs and flowering plants and annual plants to come up and bring that diversity back. And again, with the lack of mid-contract management, the vegetation, um, it, especially in areas that get, or, or parts of the country that get a lot of rain, that grass is going to get thick really fast. Uh, you can potentially run into invasive species issues. This picture here is showing um, a warm season grass CB33 buffer with um, some Cerecia lespedeza that is moving in. Um, and also tree encroachments, especially in the southeast. Tree encroachment is, is a, a challenge for CP33 buffers. Um, this actually is from Nebraska, not the southeast. But this is an example of Siberian elm. Um, moving into the to a CP33 buffer, but the point is, if you apply that mid-contract management, then that uh, is at least a tool to help keep those those issues at bay. So finally, the the last polling question, and I put this in here um, um, just uh, hopefully to get some feedback information and and, and help us to tune our our outreach message. Um, so even in those states that that maybe have a lot of CP33, um, there's always producers that they just don't think CP33 is appropriate or they're they're not interested um, in in installing a CP33 on their property. So in your opinion. What is the primary factor that discourages landowners from enrolling uh, in your state? Rental payments not high enough, uh, planting natives and forbs is too hard, fear of invasive species, um, mid-contract management requirements, or you just don't know. Okay. So it looks like, uh, let's see, don't know is up there, as well as CRP rental payments are probably our highest, um, with the, the fear of planting native grasses and forbs <laughs> right up there. Okay, well that's good information. Thank you. OK, so the last um, uh, point that I wanted to make was, was just to highlight the importance of, of trying to address restoring grassland habitat on the, um, on the landscape level scale. So the next couple slides are just examples from Missouri, um, where we have uh, basically formed quail focus areas. And the point behind these focus areas is to work with multiple landowners in a limited geography. Um, and hopefully, multiple landowners will see the value of conservation programs and implement them on their farm. So obviously, if you just have one CP33 buffer and a C of, of crop field, you're probably not going to see positive responses from birds. But however, if you have adjacent neighbors um, all working together, all of a sudden you start uh, creating a landscape scale change um, uh, with grasses in the, in the ag landscape. You can see the, the purple shading, that's all CRP. So you can tell a lot of that is pivot corners and buffers. There's some whole fields in there. But the point is, is that we are creating grassland across that landscape, not just um, shotgun, if you will, approach of a farm here and a, you know, a farm uh, 20 miles down the road. Um, and you can see from the graph, the sampling that we've done, that the, the blue bars are our sample uh, a breeding season. Um, uh, monitoring for, for quail and other grassland birds within the focus area is significantly higher um, than the monitoring points and the results that we found outside of the focus area and the control area. 
And lastly, um, this is a uh, graph of some, some population monitoring we did in another quail focus area in Missouri. And what I wanted to point out here is that not only, of course, are we, we working to provide more grassland on the entire landscape or within this geography, um, what that does is, is also provides more of a buffer, if you will, from um, uh, conditions like severe weather severe winter, things that are out of our control, it provides a buffer um, to that population. So if you'll notice in 2011, um, we had a very severe winter storm um, that year. Uh, snow and ice were, were on the ground covering um, uh, resources for, for weeks, um, the sub-zero temperatures. Um, so it was a very harsh winter. And you can see in that, that brown color is the monitoring, the population monitoring we did inside uh, the focus area. And the red bar is outside. Um, so you can see in January 2011, um, quail populations, whether you were in a focus area or not, were hit very hard. Uh, but what I want to point out is that after that winter, you'll see that the, the population within the focus area responded much quicker and um, uh, in larger numbers uh, than how the quail populations recovered outside of the focus areas. Um, the, I think the, it looks like the, the quail outside of the focus area are still trying to recover. Um, but because we had that landscape scale approach to putting as much grassland habitat as we could within the ag landscape, it provided more resources so that quail population could re re respond uh, sooner, uh, recover sooner from those inclement uh, conditions that hard winter. So finally, just some take home points. Um, again, remember to check with your local FSA office for state specific requirements. Uh, CP33 can be a very important tool to helping us keep grasslands within the ag landscape. Um, diverse native mixes of grasses and forbs is essential. Mid-contract management is essential. And when possible, landscape scale implementation is best. And always check with your local FSA office. <laughs> OK, well, that is all the information I had to share. Um, I went a little bit long, but if we have any time for questions, um, I'm happy to try to answer that, answer those.